Welcome! You're watching Dying in Grace, a program dedicated to educating our community about end-of-life issues and death and dying. Each week, we will be bringing an expert to talk about some aspect of death and dying. We really believe that death is the last taboo, and it's time that we, we broke down the barriers and had this conversation, because even though we're afraid, we're all going to experience it. So we want to get comfortable and reintegrate death as part of our life cycle, because we know the more that we embrace dying in grace, the more we'll be able to live fully till we take our last breath. I wanted to let you know that each week we ask our guests to sign a book of life where they put a name of a loved one for permanent remembrance in our book of life. And now you too can do that as well if you go to our website, dyingingrace.com. So just click on that. You can also see our other shows and you can uh, follow us on Twitter at Dying in Grace. And of course, our show will be rebroadcast on TVSB as well. So tonight, my guest is Simon Fox, and Simon is the Executive Director of Adventures in Caring. Uh, and thank you so much, Simon, for being here. It's a pleasure. So uh, I asked you here particularly because so many people are caregivers. They're uh, either going to be caregivers, they have been caregivers, or they're going to be caregiving themselves or currently. So it's right. a big topic and it's not one that people think about as much when we're talking about death and dying. But before we get into all of that, tell us about the Adventures in Caring, your organization. Tell us a little bit how it got started. Sure. Um, well, it began with my wife, Karen Fox, and she founded it in, in 1984. And it was all about how, in addition to medical care, that people have this deep need for emotional support and friendship, a, a, a friend on that journey of healing. And, um, and that's why it became Adventures in Caring, because it is caring as more than simply a task or a chore or a duty or an obligation. It's, it's, a, it's caring for others as a journey of discovery, mm -hmm. right? And, and so she, and our program is, is best known for our Raggedy Ann and Andy program, right? right. We, which is designed to bring a safe character to the bedside of someone who's seriously ill. And the purpose being to, to support the subjective side of healing. You know, the, the, the medical science ad addresses the objective side, the scientific side. But there's also that human experience of living with an illness, having one, and the hopes and dreams and emotions and relationships and communication, all the subjective side of it, and how do we support that? So that also helps the healing process. And so Karen's idea was simply to present someone safe to talk to mm -hmm. at the bedside because people are not just suffering from an illness. They're str struggling with fear of their own mortality. Exactly. Fear of pain. Will I get through this? Will I not? And, and all the, the emotional struggles and soul pain that goes on with that. And how do we support people? So, so that's how it began. And, and Karen's one of these very talented communicators, uh, mostly due to she's had a, a lifetime of ill health. Mm -hmm. She knows what it's like to be a patient all too mm -hmm. well. But also, she grew up overseas. Um, her dad was in the State Department, so she grew up in Ethiopia and Iraq and uh, in Italy and had to learn to communicate with all strata of society, right. all, kind, all faiths, all languages. She spoke about five languages. And so she, had to, she developed this brilliant ability to communicate and could connect with patients. And so what Adventures in Caring has always been about is can we take that gift that she so clearly had, and so do there are gifted doctors and gif gifted nurses, gifted right. therapists who, and we all know who they are. They have that knack of connecting with the patients, yes. right? And, and a, a few do. Uh, a lot of us don't. I certainly didn't. And, and when I came across Karen and saw what she was doing, I was I was amazed. I didn't realize she, those kinds of conversations could be engaged in. And so we had to figure out, can this be taught? That, that, can compassion be taught? 
And it can be. And, and, it can. and that's what you've so beautifully um, proven with your program after all the over all these years is yeah. it, it, it can be. And while I think of compassion as part of bringing my heart, and, and what, I, what I hear is all, all too often the medical profession is treating the symptom and it's kind of a mind brain and we need all that we need those brains we need that excellence that intelligence yeah. but often um, we forget that you're treating a whole person I am yeah. not just my symptom I am not just the injury uh, and what I know too is um, when there's a neutral party that comes from a caring place mm -hmm. uh, there's an opening because I can say to you, a perfect stranger, what's really true about how I'm feeling, instead of putting on the bravado, I may be putting on for my loved right. one. So yeah. it's a beautiful uh, gift. So I want to ask you to tell a little bit about your own background because I think, yeah, you are the test case for compassion. I mean, <laughs> not that you're not compassionate, but tell yeah. us where you came from because you're right. very much in the scientific world, yes? Sure, yeah. No, I. Yeah, just, I mean, it was a double whammy. I, typically, um, my background is in physics, right? Okay, and so you're a scientist. Scientist, and, and I was a very typically reserved Brit. So, I, you know, new to the United, relatively new to the United States, right? So shy, and, and so I had none of that skill set that Karen, oh, and by the way, I'd never been in a hospital in my life. I'd been, oh, blessed, wow. with, been blessed with good health and, and as an athlete my whole life. So the idea of being sick was very foreign, and, yeah. and going into a hospital is like, how, it, it was a different world. A and they speak a different language, right? All the med medical right. jargon and everything, which a lot of people experience. They go into the hospital for the first time, or relatively rarely, and how do you make sense of it? And right. so I was really impressed, and I, I knew I clearly didn't have the skill set. Other people were wanting to learn to do what Karen was doing. And so I'd had some background in training. I'd managed to teach uh, engineers in Silicon Valley um, in aerospace uh, how to communicate with one another. So I'd like, okay, can we apply some of those tools to teaching people how to communicate with those who are seriously ill in, in a way that supports their healing process? So it, it had a purpose to it. And that's clearly what Karen was doing. She was engaging people in a way that empowered them. Mm. She, so she was drawing forth the best in them. And in, in many ways, it was a paradox. Even though she was dressed as Raggedy Ann, she wasn't the star of the show. Right. The patient was. Right. She was drawing out the best in them by being a really good listener. And so from there, we developed a, we've developed an entire team of anywhere from 60 to 90 volunteers, mostly students now, pre-med students, who are learning these skills at the very front end of their career. And it was the students, actually, and their questions to you after their experiences, as I recall you saying, right. that had you look at the whole, how do we care for the caregivers? Yes. How do we move in? Because I'm taking on these things, I knew it, my concern is for the other person, but now I'm starting to experience what has been called compassion fatigue, a little bit of that. Somewhat. It, it wasn't that they were getting the compassion fatigue. What they're doing as pre-nursing students or pre-medical uh, students, often in addition to our program, they will also be shadowing a doctor, a nurse, uh -huh. right, or uh, an EMT, people like that. And these people are like 20 years ahead of them on the career path, and they're fried. Right. And so they're looking to me and Karen and saying, well, I want to do this noble work. I, I'm called to be in this profession, but I don't want to end up like that. Right. right? It is like, so, so they came to us and said, you know, the qu simple question, not a simple answer, but the simple question was, how do I not burn out? How do I get engaged in this field where you come across some very tragic human suffering on a regular basis and not end up like a lot of nurses and doctors and emergency right. professionals um, who are burning out or at a horrific rates. Uh, and, and when you start to look at the statistics, um, 
I mean, nurses experience more on-the-job violence than any other profession. Really? Yeah. I mean, nursing assistants get injured more often yeah. than any other profession, more than construction workers. And we they, don't think about that. It, exactly. Exactly. Um, doctors, when we started this project, burnout rate among physicians was 45%. It's now over 60. You've got about a third of them clinically depressed. Surgeons think about suicide about three times more than the general population. And I mean, then you ask yourself, how can this healer heal me yes. if that's their mindset? You've got sick people looking after sick people. Right. And it's like, this is not a good recipe for, right. for a good health care. And um, so we were asked this question by the students, and as we looked into it, it became apparent that it's a far more serious problem than we realized. Than, than most people realize. And uh, one of the consequences of it is when people are burned out or they've got compassion fatigue, not only does it damage them, but as, as Father Richard Rohr said, you know, pain that's not transformed is transmitted. It leaks out and hurts the people closest to right. you. And you tend to make lousy decisions and you make mistakes. And so that's why we see, we see in conjunction with this rapid rise in burnout, you've, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. Wow, that's really scary. You've got heart disease, cancer, medical errors. Far worse problem than traffic accidents, Alzheimer's disease. Wow. It's, and it's, it's not talked about. It's not talked about, no. And yeah. the other piece of that is it's not just um, the medical side of things. Certainly you make errors that way. But I also know, just from my own experience in the healthcare profession, someone lashes out a caregiver, a professional, or a family caregiver in their fatigue, in their anxiety, in whatever, lashes out at the loved one, the person they're caring for, and yeah. then they spiral into a guilt thing, and oh, then there's the yeah. resentment, and, and there's just no exactly. help. I mean, right. it just gets worse and worse and worse, especially if you're doing somebody with a chronic illness over or the long haul. It right. just, there's, so you created oxygen for the caregivers or a, a multi-tiered program. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, it is what it says, oxygen for caregivers. It's, it's the idea was how do we create a breath of fresh air for, for people in, who are caregivers, either as a professional or a volunteer. Um, we've, we've learned from the professionals because they're, they are really in the thick of things where they encounter tragedy and heartbreak a lot. And, it's their and life. I mean, it's, it's their day-to-day -day -day work. Yeah. A huge number of them are traumatized themselves through this. And, and so we, we went into it and we, we interviewed a ton of people about this and, and found out, especially for the ones who are still in their career and, th and thriving, what are they doing right? And interviewed them. And then out of everything we learned about what they were doing right and taking the best of modern research and the best of ancient wisdom and our own present experience and putting the whole thing together and discerning, well, what, what can be done realistically here? Um, so and I think we have a video. We, we do. We, we do, have a yeah. video that shows some of that. So maybe we can, can yeah. that will help have some of those voices. So let's go to the clip. Life today is hard enough. We call it stress, depression, burnout, compassion fatigue. And the smarter we get, the more we seem to have of it. That's just life, they say. You're emotionally tired because you have to be on all day and responsible for so many people. I do bring my worries home, um, my patients' worries, my family's worries. Um, People who get to the point of burnout begin to lose uh, the idealism of why they went into their chosen profession to begin with. It's rough on a team. I remember after that rescue, here it is, we've saved two people, but we're having the stress or the depression or whatever have you of, wow, we, we, if we would have worked faster, if we could have worked harder, would we have been able to get that third lady out? What happens during threat is you also get the increases in heart rate and ventricular contractility, so it doesn't distinguish uh, threat from challenge, but you get vasoconstriction and blood flow goes down.
If the doctors don't have time, and the nurses don't have time, and the social workers don't have time, and the psychologists don't have time, how do we heal people when everybody's in a hurry? It's a new way of looking at things, and it's a fundamental change in context from the pursuit of excellence to the pursuit of wholeness. And that is such a big shift for most people to get their heads around because most education, most occupations, most training is focused on the pursuit of excellence. Mindfulness allows you to be focused and to notice, but mindfulness also allows you to have a sort of an expanded awareness. This way of relating to ourselves, relating to our own experiences, starts to change things. And it becomes a way of embracing where we hurt. Well, that clip really spoke to things I think that first responders in our own community are certainly dealing with with our, our recent um, challenges here in, in our own community. Simon, so, mean, what you've offered is a, a kind of, of remedy, like you said, a breath of fresh air. How is your program being received and, and how are the are medical and professional people and maybe even family caregivers, how can they access it? So where is it being used? Um. I'm, I'm real happy to say it's, it's being used here in, in town um, with um, the local college, Santa Barbara City College, is using it in their memory caregiver program. Young nurses are, are learning, learning these skills. And um, visiting nurse and hospice care is using it. Um, and all of our other materials to, for their, all their staff to go through to, to fortify their ability to basically to sustain the capacity to care right. is what it, the purpose of it. Um, because these are tough jobs, these, these people well, are Well, hospice, using. too, is this yeah. whole, you know, dying in great, you know, yeah, you're dying. Exactly. How do you bear witness to that day after day with loving and compassion? Right. Yeah, I'm, pri I'm especially proud of the work. Now it's, it's going global. Um, LNEC, which stands for End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, um, they are using our, this Oxygen for Caregivers program is part of their self-care module for training hospice and palliative care nurses around the world. So this has now been done in uh, Kenya and China and um, Czechoslovakia and Romania. So um, it's a worldwide problem. Nurses around the world are, are and doctors and everybody in healthcare is is really under a tremendous amount of pressure these days. And what's underestimated is that it's not just the workload it's the emotional impact of seeing human suffering up close and personal day in day out mm -hmm. which is emotionally wearing and that's what leads to compassion fatigue um, and a lot of people talk about the problem very few have developed comprehensive solutions so this program is a way of working to build the capacity to for protection and, and also to build resilience. So if I'm a family caregiver, you know, right. I'm not a professional. Right. I just, I'm just taking care of my mom because her health is declining and she's living with us and I got two little kids. And yeah. how, how can they access the information and, and is it applicable? The, the, the tools you're teaching the professionals, can a family caregiver use them as well? Oh, absolutely they can. Absolutely. The, the professionals, are, they're in the thick of it, right? right? So the family caregivers, too, is in the thick of it, a little bit different angle, but the principles are the same. And, and what we discovered was the same principles of extending compassion to others are the, really the fundamental principles for self-renewal, where you extend compassion to yourself. And you have something called the four A's. Could you right. just name them and... Give sure. us a, a quick overview of how I might use them for myself. Yeah, um, they're part of what we came up with as of all the people interviewed and the, the research and the best practices, we essentially came up with the ABCs of resilience. Ah. 
A is awareness, self-awareness. B is balance, uh, this ebb and flow and reciprocity in your life. And C is these healing connections where you've got something to hold on to. So those are the fundamental principles. There's a lot to each of those. But the A, the awareness, is what you're speaking of, the four A's. Because it's not just any old awareness. It's, it's, like, it's like that um, great quote attributed to a lot of different people, which is, you know, watch your words. Excuse me, watch your thoughts, they become words. Mm -hmm. Watch your words, they become actions. Right. Right? Watch yes. your actions, they become habits. Habits become character. Character right. becomes destiny. But how do you watch that? Right. Especially it's, when I'm overwhelmed. Especially, how do you watch yourself when you're overwhelmed, when you're cranky, when things are not going well, when you just want to, you know, tear your hair out? Um, and the four A's are a way of doing that because it's watching with kindness. It's not any old awareness. It's it, they, the four A's that you asked about. The first one is attention. Um, but it's attention with... The secret to attention is being interested, mm. right? Mm -hmm. If you go to a lecture and you're not interested, it's hard to pay attention, right? right exactly right. right. Right, and if you're not interested in your own experience, you know, a lot of people just want to move to the next thing, right? You know, so that, that's attention. Then there's acknowledgement based on what you noticed, right? Is that are you sending a positive message to others or to yourself? What's right. your what's the quality of your own self talk? Are you Right, are and you that's, harsh on yourself? That or, inner critic can the, be pretty, pretty yeah, harsh. E exactly, right. exactly. So the acknowledgement, the affection is that choice to be kind yeah. to you. Yeah. You know? And acceptance is this is what we're working with. It's, yeah, this is right? how it is. This is yeah. how it is what it is. And it, is, is how, it is what it is, and but how it, can I work with it? How can I work with it? And a certain appreciation of that yep. right yep. you know the, exactly the rough right. and the smooth of it right it's kind of yeah. the serenity prayer you know it's what, what i can change <laughs> and understanding what i can't yeah. so i wanted to ask you um what's the biggest challenge that you think caregivers face today and is it the same for the professionals and family caregivers or is it different it, it, it's a little bit different but it's similar um i think the biggest challenge is is getting out of balance mm. The fundamental thing is, life is not sustainable without balance. Service is not sustainable without balance. Caregiving is not sustainable without balance. We, life breathes. We have to breathe in, we have to breathe out. And, and caregivers need to learn to receive. Exactly. And they, they don't. Exactly. And, they, the, and it's partly the industrial model of healthcare is that provider, consumer. Right. Providers are expected to provide, consumers consume, and but that's just a one-way street to burnout. That's right. we have to have this reciprocity back, this back and forth, like the tides, like breathing, and that's got to be built into our lives. And that's probably the biggest problem: is thinking we're a machine and don't need to breathe, mm. but we do. And and I think the other thing to remember is first principle of healing from Hippocrates: first do no harm. Right. And that includes and it, yourself as well as exactly, the patient. Exactly. didn't yeah. say it's okay, don't harm the patient, but you can yeah. hurt the caregiver. Right, it's right. Not, Burn <laughs> yourself out. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, so, so those are the fundamental principles, and there's a lot to eat. They're simple to say. Of course. But, but what we realize is, is self-care is not just a regimen. It's not just like brushing your teeth or, or even doing yoga or something. It's a, so it's a lifelong journey right. that, that you weave these constructive things into your life over years. And, the, and that's what results in resilience. That's how you, you don't know? burn out 20 that's, years into the it, field. Uh, that's exactly right. And our hope was if we gave these skills to young people at the big, in their 20s, they'll have the protection they need by the time they're 40, when it really counts. And so that's, that's our hope. So I wanted to um, make sure that we invite people to go to your website because a lot of the tools that you're talking about are there. Yep. And um, the website I believe we have up is adventuresincaring.org. Yep. And I thought it was great. You can become a member, but it doesn't cost anything. You Correct. just put your name in there and you can find out 
the latest things and do tell us you have a, a, a brand new pro, a program that you're working on. Can you just share yeah. with us what that is for our viewers who, you know, want to know? Well, we, we created this Oxygen for Caregivers online and it'll be out in a couple of months from now and you'll find out about it through the website but if you become a member we'll let you know as soon as it's available and the idea was that then anywhere anybody anywhere in the world can have access to this um, and it will be a, a full-fledged course that engages people in this transformative process of protecting themselves from burnout building resilience and sustaining their ability to care uh, and it's just as applicable to family caregivers as, as it is the, the professionals. I think it's such an important lesson for anybody to learn. I, I think, I don't care what profession you're right. in, yeah. social workers that are working out in the field, all of us need to learn. Right. We have a culture that is driven and achievement doesn't always sit next to taking care of yourself. It just right. is the message we haven't learned yet and I'm so excited that you want to change that. Um, as we're we're closing out. Do you have a final message you would like to tell to both the professional and the family caregivers that are out there? Something, some words of hope or some encouragement? Uh, yeah, I mean, self care is a choice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, good health, we can never take for granted. And I encourage everybody to, to cultivate that. And in yourself and in others, um, we have to walk our talk, so the idea of health professionals not being healthy, not a, not a great idea, <laughs> not a great example. So if but I could sum it up, it's take care of yourself so that you can help take care of others. That's really well said. it. Yeah. So I, uh, Simon, we'll have to have you back to talk about this. We want to have you back when the online program's launched, and I want to th um, thank you, Simon Fox, I also would like to thank my crew, um, Elliot Jacobson, Mike Nicholson, and uh, Ken Baxter, sorry Ken, and also once again we want to thank uh, TVSB for allowing us this great opportunity. And Simon, the Book of Living Love is here. I'd like to invite you to put a name of a loved one in our book, please. And Thanks, thank Simon. you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you.